Uh, when redistricting was done uh, the last time, you know, Carroll was broken into into half, and and half went to uh, to Congressional District One, and the other half is now in Congressional District Eight. Uh, Carroll County is is I think pretty homogenous as a county goes. So to be represented by two representatives does create some issues. Basically, in Westminster is the dividing line. So south of Westminster is Jamie's district, uh, a fairly uh, progressive Democrat representing that part of our county, and the northern part currently represented by Dr. Harris. I, we make no bones that, that Carroll County, again, as a whole, is a, is a conservative county. Even the Democrats, I think, in Carroll County are, are pretty conservative, as is probably the case on the Eastern Shore and much of northern, across that northern tier of Maryland. Classify. There is certainly an agricultural component to this county, particularly the northern part of the county. It is still an agrarian-based economy for a lot of people. There's still a lot of working farms. That has historically been a big factor uh, in Carroll County and its politics. Uh, we also are, are known as a bedroom community where a lot of people commute either to the Baltimore or even to the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Frederick is a big draw. It has grown a lot, a lot of medical and high tech in that area. So a lot of people do commute commute um, uh, to, the, to those uh, you know, more populated areas where the jobs are. Uh, right now in Carroll County, the, the, the economic situation is still, still pretty tight. Uh, you know, farm, it's hard to make a living farming. Small business, they encourage small business to come, but uh, it's, it, that's a tough sell in Carroll County. We, uh, we can go into the particulars on that. I would say at least half of our population commutes out of county. Uh, for employment though. The local groups that have formed uh, since the 2016 election, we have a number here in Carroll County, uh, one of which Carroll Can, it's a community action network, is very active and very interested in local races, including this Congressional District 1 race. So just the energy and the enthusiasm from the members of these grassroots organizations tells me that there is something, something in the wind. The Democrats, the progressive with, progressives would like to make this a reference referendum on Trump. I guess we'll see in the coming months whether that's a reality or not. Um, I think it, it certainly should be a referendum on Trump. And in this district especially, I think in Andy Harris, the incumbent, he has made no bones about his support for Trump and that agenda. Uh, he's a, uh, one of the leading members of the Freedom Caucus. So I think it's, it's not a stretch to paint him with the same brush as you would Donald Trump. And I, and I believe you know, these primary candidates and whoever is successful in the primary and gets the nomination, uh, I'm sure they will try to make this a referendum on Donald Trump. Going back to what I just said earlier about the grassroot, grassroots organizations, this Carol Can group, which is very active, primarily, uh, you know, is, are women. Um, there are certainly men in the organization. I know the leadership. The leadership from the very beginning has been women, and that's who's driving, you know, that bus. I, I do think that, that Andy Harris is concerned about this election, and I think he needs to consolidate his base. That's what a primary election really is all about. You know, you come into the primary, you need to solidify your base so you get that nomination. You know, this is politics 101, and then for the general, maybe you can run a little bit more to the center. I'm, Andy Harris isn't calling me for campaign strategy, but, but you know, that's, that's not entirely surprising. I think this is the best chance uh, for, for a change in this district that I can recall. So, uh